Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this webinar on placemaking. My name is Hermione Warmington, and I am the housing advisor at the CLA. Today, we'll be looking at building beautiful homes and creating living, working communities. Housing has always been central to our work at the CLA, forming part of our rural powerhouse campaign, where we are calling for a planning system to be designed for rural areas to help unlock the potential of the rural economy. And so today's webinar on creating beautiful, thriving communities could not be more relevant. For many, lockdown has given a new perspective on the value of home, whether it be the home's ability to transform into a classroom, offering a space to work remotely from, or providing a place to cope with the anxieties of a global pandemic. Home has never been more important. And more than the home, this pandemic has really shone a light on the importance of community with recent research, perhaps unsurprisingly, showing that the pandemic has helped to reignite people's interest in their local community and sparked a desire to be more involved. We know that good design can shape and inform how communities work. And so it has been great to see beauty and design rise up the government's agenda, independent of the pandemic, although arguably now more important. There has always been some nod to design in the national planning policy framework, but as many of you will know, this is not often translated into what we see actually being developed. Only recently, I wrote an advisory handbook called A Landowner's Guide to Rural Housing Development, and this included a chapter on design. And I was asked to pick a photo for its front cover from an online from an online photo bank and I spent hours trailing through all of these really uninspiring photos of big volume developments and it was really difficult to find one I was happy with and that exercise really reaffirmed for me the need for some level of intervention on beauty and design because otherwise the market, for the most part, will continue to deliver the sort of homes which are worlds away from the homes and developments which we are going to hear about today. As a brief policy overview, in late 2019, the government published their National Design Guide, and this set out how well-designed places could be achieved in practice but what it didn't do was provide any mechanisms or incentives for developers to do so. And at a similar time, the government commissioned an independent body to advise them on how to promote and increase the use of high quality design for new build homes and neighbourhoods. The Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission, which may sound familiar to you, published their final report last January called Living with Beauty. And we have seen a number of their recommendations brought forward within the planning for the future consultation and more recently the national planning policy framework and national model design code consultation both of these are seeking to embed beauty and design into the planning system and something that we will hear a lot more about this afternoon so I am really looking forward to hearing from our three speakers today who have an enormous amount of experience in creating beautiful places. Our first speaker is Hugh Petter, an architect and urban planner specialising in traditional design and who is director of Adam Architecture. Our second speaker is Charlie Anderson, who is a solicitor and partner at Farrer & Co and who's best known for his work on community developments for landowners and promoters. And our third speaker is Anthony McNamay, who is a solicitor and associate at Farrer & Co, and who specialises in helping clients navigate the planning and consenting regimes in England, Wales and Scotland. So after their three presentations, we will be running a poll, which we would love you to answer. A box should pop up in the middle of your screen for you to select an answer and we will publish the results there and then. 
And then after the poll, we will have our Q&A session. So if you would like to ask a question either to a specific speaker or to the whole panel, please use the Q&A function of Zoom at any point. You may have already spotted the Q&A button highlighted at the bottom, but you can see it now on your screen what you should be looking for. Please don't use the chat function, but do put it in the Q&A box. So in the Q&A session, I will read out the questions with the name of the person who asked them. So if you would like to be anonymous, just pop anonymous at the end of your question and I won't read out the name. I should also remind you that today's session is being recorded for delegates, for delegates to watch on demand. So I would now like to introduce our first speaker, Hugh Petter. Thank you very much, Hermione. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be uh, part of the panel this afternoon. My thanks to you and the CLA, uh, and also to um, Faraz for inviting me to join you um, today. I'm just trying to get my first slide there. There we are. Um, so this first slide is uh, my uh, effort to encapsulate what's wrong with the planning system at the moment. Um, if we start at sort of four o'clock, the, the fact is that most development now is unpopular. And of course, that in turn creates political pressure, which in turn results in increasing regulation. And that in turn results in the increased cost of trying to secure a planning permission. And so that in turn reduces the number of developers who've got deep enough pockets to fund that speculative risk. And with bigger developers, you tend to get a more formulaic approach, which, as we know, is not uh, doesn't produce good development. And so it goes around in a never ending circle. So the exam question really, to my mind, is what we can do to break this. Um, and to my mind, um, at least, landowners have uh, one of the main keys that can be used to unlock that situation because landowners have both the land and they can also impose a vision beyond that which the planning system can insist on because the planning system can only be reasonable in legal terms, but landowners can be rather more dogmatic. And therefore they have the power with some of the um, help that people like Farrah's can produce to control better outcomes. The image on your screen now is effectively a poster for one of the, my projects uh, with the Duchy of Cornwall at Nans Ledden on the north coast of Cornwall, a 4,000 house mixed use uh, urban extension to the town of Newquay, which we'll come back to uh, in a minute. Um, to my mind, uh, it's very important with uh, landowner controlled projects or very useful anyway, that at the outset there should be a series of principles uh, which are agreed uh, to help encourage clear thinking, not only on the landowner home team, but also they become more compelling when presenting the pro prospect to third parties, to other stakeholders and to the local authority. And over time, as the team gets bigger, these can be used also to make sure that the team remains focused and the developer partners can also be, through legal controls, made to deliver that vision without dilution. And of course, all these things rely to extent on collaboration. It's not just about having legal control. You want to find kindred parties who are willing to, who are motivated by the principles which you've identified and will work together to uh, produce something exceptional. And of course, uh, where a landowner has a long-term interest beyond that which a developer would normally have, that can also be more compelling and therefore help to build confidence in the community. This is something which is going to be delivered rather than just something which is fine words to secure a planning permission. And of course, they can be used to measure the success in due course. So on your screen now are the 10 principles identified at the outset for Nans Ledden. It would be governed by public consultation, controlled by a master plan, uh, led by sustainability, uh, reflecting local identity, where possible using Cornish resources, responding to local need, relating well to the town, considering environmental impact, using land efficiently and being viable. Um, local character is talked about an, a lot now in um, current and emerging policy, and a lot of the projects we're involved with, uh, that is a governing factor. Uh, and we find one of the most effective ways um, to uh, consider um, local character, to understand it, is through doing um, a pattern book. Um, unfortunately, my slides seem to have frozen up, but hopefully, that, well, there we are. Um, so this is um, a page from the pattern book for Newquay, uh, looking first at the urban form in the old part of the town. This is a page looking at the nature of a high street, its width and proportions, how it relates to contours, the kinds of buildings along its edge and so on. Um, and then the next section 
um, looks at building types, in this case, double fronted houses with a central front door and a window either side, a very particular type of house often found in Cornwall on steep sloping sites because it involves minimal um, excavation with the road following the contour of the land. Um, this will be discussed more by um, Charlie and, and Anthony in due course, um, but the vision and strategy documents a landowner might assemble can then be used to um, bring together a consortium of developers and then through um, landowner control, those developers can work with the um, team to make sure that the principles identified at the outset can be delivered and that, that extra quality and control of character can also be uh, delivered uh, through the scheme. And in due course, if people buy houses there, that they, um, whether those houses are looked after, can be controlled through a design and community code. Again, we can come back to that in more detail later. So the first example I want to show you is known as Tregunnel Hill in Newquay. It was a site for 174 houses. Um, it was effectively the warm-up site for the main scheme of Nansleden. Uh, it has employment space on it as well, unusual for a scheme of this size at the time it was built. And it was delivered by two house builders uh, working side by side. And for us, it was a way of uh, really trialing some of the ideas about reflecting local character. We'd have been exploring through the pattern book um, exercise. Uh, by working with the house builders, we were using their standard house types, um, but by the effort was put into making sure that the layout of the site, the width of the streets, the character of the streets, reflected local character as identified in the pattern book, and also that the street elevations were bespoke. They were designed to reflect the kind of street. So on a main street, there would be grander architecture, and on a minor street, there would be much quieter architecture. And a few buildings, as you can see, there's one um, stone-faced building and one slate-hung building, are in key locations where they have a large visual impact upon the quality of the environment. And the approach taken to the economics of that is those buildings which are prominent visually are, um, have extra money invested in them and then you save some money on one of the side buildings. So across the whole development it's the right build price per square foot but you spend money where it adds value in place making terms. Um, hopefully you can see from the slides I've shown you there's a clear hierarchy of streets immediately perceptible um, some streets have grander architecture and wider carriageways, others are much tighter, more like a West Country lane with very subdued architecture, uh, which follows, it goes down the contour often in this particular scheme, um, but it, it gives it a very distinctive um, character. And as I say, this was very much a, a tester for the main site at Nansleden. Uh, on the bottom left-hand side, you'll see an Art Deco building. To our mind, Art Deco was part of the Cornish vernacular on the, being on the seaside uh, coast. Uh, and th th this building contains a mixture of employment space on the ground floor with affordable apartments um, above. Um, the main scheme at, at Nanseddon is now on site. Um, it is a, a project of 4,000 homes on the edge of Newquay. Uh, it's being delivered in phases with about 100 houses a year. It's being delivered by three house builders uh, and, and there are walkable neighbourhoods. You can see on this slide that there are five local centres identified uh, in the um, purple colour and the red line, um, red circle drawn around them is a five minute walk from those local centres where you expect to find employment and uh, mixed use space. And so the idea is this is a walkable scheme where you don't have to use your car to go to the shops, the school or the office. On the right hand side uh, is a version of the master plan with the hierarchy of the streets uh, identified with the colours. So the most busy streets are red, the next streets um, are brown and yellow and the quietest streets are blue. Of Nansleden, 500 houses are built um, so far. Um, we've started building employment space and we've got already 20 businesses uh, up and running there who've been open throughout the pandemic and doing really well. We've got another 40 local businesses all looking for space and waiting for us to build the next cluster of uh, commercial units. A primary school has been built, the first in Cornwall for 30 years and is really popular. Uh, and 30% of the houses are affordable and they are 10 year blind. So you've no idea when you walk past the front, whether it's an open market house or an affordable house, and they're spread in clusters throughout the whole development rather than put into one place. Um, the architecture is characteristically very simple, but with good materials, materials from the West Country, or if not from the West Country, then from other parts of the UK. So the slate you see here is either Cornish slate or Welsh slate, and all the other materials come uh, from the region or from the UK if it can't, uh, come more locally. So there's an imperative to spend money locally and put as much back into the local economy as possible, which again was a landowner control, which the planning system could never acquire. 
And as a consequence for these efforts, the scheme has grown in popularity from 400 houses, the original allocation, to the 4,000 houses as it now is. And to make development popular, to my mind, is the key to overcoming some of the obstacles of the planning system identified in my first slide. My next example is Cecil Square in Stamford, um, which is part of the Burley House estate. It was a site previously occupied by a sports centre which had outgrown its premises. This is only 40 houses, but the similar principles apply to the ones I showed you in Cornwall. But in this case, obviously, it's trying to reflect Stamford character with local materials and the types of houses and buildings you expect to see um, in that part of the world. And as with the Cornish example, people who buy houses here, that they, they, they subscribe to a design and community code which controls how the public realm is looked after um, ever after. Cecil Square, like Tregunnel Hill, was a tester site for a scheme which is yet to start in Stamford on the north side of the town, a scheme of 2,000 houses known as um, Stamford North, uh, three quarters of which is controlled by the Burley um, House Estate. Uh, and that uh, will be um, is going through the local plan process at the moment. It will have effectively a new um, sub town centre. You can see the orange dots on the left hand slide showing where we're imagining there'll be a concentration of mixed use development to take some stress off the historic um, core of the town. And again, we're looking at walkable neighbourhoods with those five and 10 minute walkable isochrones to show that we're trying to make sure this is also a pedestrian friendly development. You don't have to use your car uh, to navigate your way around it. This next example um, is a site in the Cotswolds on the edge of a village, this time only 40 houses. Uh, but again, as with the other two schemes, trying to reflect local character. So a similar pattern book study has been done uh, and the um, road on the south side on the bottom of the um, plan uh, effectively shows um, houses as you might expect to find on the edge of a village, leading to what uh, on the right hand side there is designed conceptually as a converted farmyard. Uh, with converted barns and a farmhouse at the end of it in terms of their character. So the idea is it fits with the kind of overall character of the village and how it might have evolved uh, in previous times. Uh, this has been worked up in concert with the parish council so it's responding very much to local need to provide small houses for first, first time buyers who grew up in the village and also for empty nesters who want to stay there but want to move out of their bigger houses. These are some early sketches showing again how about looking at local character it's possible with standard house builder plans to make the buildings look like they belong to their location. Um, on the top slide a series of affordable houses designed like an arms house cluster around a little square and then on the bottom slide the view, approach to the village from the south. My next example um, is in Hampshire at Romsey. Um, a leftover site between the edge of a 1960s development and a historic pub. Um, again, a trial site for two bigger um, schemes owned by the same landowner. This one is finished, the other two have yet to get going. Uh, this was delivered by two house builders um, with, again, their standard house plans, but using um, local materials. Um, so a lot of brick um, and also state produced oak uh, timber for the um, timber panelling. Um, and you can see on the slides, we've used Flemish bond um, brickwork, which is marginally more expensive than stretcher bond. That gives a much more tweedy sophisticated character so even though these are machine made bricks it still massively increases the quality of appearance of these otherwise very simple buildings. My next scheme um, is at Woodstock in Oxfordshire uh, part of the Blenheim estate this one is 300 houses with a mixed use uh, component as well um, there previously been 200 houses refused on this site um, and uh, by another team um, and we began by looking at the history of the evolution of Woodstock and in fact whilst there's a, a Georgian historic market core there are outlying hamlets which have been um, subsumed into the town over time and so to try and make it feel right we decided that this should have effectively a new conceptual um, settlement on the edge of Woodstock which has been co-joined with it over time so there's a road that goes right through it with a mixed-use core in the middle and you can see the site plan and some elevations uh, on the right hand side and then the next slide shows um, a CGI of the mixed use centre, which will be started to construct shortly. And then a few pictures of some of the buildings that have been finished there. Again, this has proved immensely popular locally using local materials. And again, hopefully with a clearly distinctive uh, variety of types of buildings to give the, the, the variety of accommodation that you would want in these schemes for people of all stages of life and from all backgrounds. Um, some of the touchstones for our work, um, the two documents that my practice have produced, 
uh, Tomorrow's Home was looking at the emerging social trends of the 18 to 34 year old cohort uh, and Making Better Places is really a portfolio with details of some of the schemes I've shown you today. And there's a third document, Placemaking, which is a joint production with Farrer and Co, which Anthony will talk a bit more about later. But now it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Charlie Anderson, a partner at Farrer and Company. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hugh. Um, I will be speaking to um, the legal points that uh, arise quite commonly in the structures and agreements on the legacy projects. Um, and in particular, I'll be looking at um, the key factor really in all of this is the level of landowner control and input into the project. And there are two distinct periods that we cover in the legal structures, the development period, and then post development, what I call the estate management period. And in all of this, as Hugh has stressed so far, that the landowner's project principles really are to achieve and deliver and maintain high quality master planning and design and a stewardship and legacy role to ensure it thrives during the estate management period. And all of this, the objective is to secure the desired ret returns that's financial and social. And increasingly we're seeing evidence 20 years on through, for example, Knight Frank report, Savile's reports, that the financial returns on these types of projects are significantly higher than non-legacy projects. And of course, an important consideration is the enhancement of the reputation of the landowner. The turning to the development period first, well, of course, as Hugh said, design is the key for the landowner. And in the legal documents, the principal elements we're looking to protect traditionally have always been the external layout, the appearance and materials. And that's across the residential commercial community premises, but increasingly public realm and the facilities in the public realm. And as Hermione was saying, COVID has really shown how important the public realm and facilities are as people are spending more time working at home. But in these projects, most recently, there's been increasing attention to the technology and sustainability within building structures and systems. If you look what Joseph Roundtree have been doing, that's an area where landowners are taking an increasing design interest and control. Within the development period, um, the legal documents, I tend to cover the two principal stages. There's the planning application stage, the planning application scheme, where the design is worked up to get planning. And then post planning, we will provide in the agreements to work up a work scheme, which goes right the way through to what we call working drawings. And those are the actual on site um, as, as being built drawings to make sure the design is carried right the way through to the end. So the design specification, um, the agreement will have provisions which will be there to ensure that the approved scheme as approved by the land, landowner is delivered. And, Hugh referred to that, uh, to the flow chart, and that is a very useful um, exercise, which we refer to in the agreements, which shows the route through to an approved scheme, scheme, and which we hope gives the developer the confidence that there will be a certain journey and a certain outcome. And obviously, when you go to an illegal agreement in these projects, there are various stages of design which might apply. So for example, if you're very early with a promotion or option agreement, there'll be a much more limited amount of detailed design available at that stage. You might have an agreement with a base scheme where you're further on in the project, or most advanced at all, you might be having the luxury of an agreement with a planning permission and a very detailed scheme worked up, which obviously gives you more certainty. But in all of this, there will be agreement provisions to ensure that the scheme as approved by the landowner is delivered. In the development period, from the landowner's position, the factors which influence the design provisions in the agreement. Well, obviously there could be a retained estate, so a desire to protect and enhance that. It could be part of a multi-phase site or uh, a multi-phase or multi-site development, where it's very significant to get the first phase and the first site right to set the design and the return standard for the future phases. Or it could be there's a concern to make sure that the design is actually delivered as required and built because of consideration in the transaction, investment premises may be delivered for the landowner or the landowner may have a vested interest in overage. So a key concern to make sure it's built properly. So this tends to lead 
very much the agreements to provide that the landowner has to have discretion in respect of approval of the scheme. But looking at it from the developer's position, obviously developers, as you'll be aware, house builders have a general concern about design constraints and particular factors, what they've got to build. They may seek flexibility to revert, to limit or vary the type of material. And also in the context of protecting labor costs, they may look to go to section 73 varying applications to change the approved scheme. And also a key factor for them, as we all know, absorption rates they're going to want to make sure the documents allow flexibility in that respect. So generally, a landowner will be look, a developer will be looking to the landowner to act reasonably or to agree to a dispute resolution process in respect of the approval of the scheme. So as you can see, you've got discretion for landowner looking to balance against a developer seeking some degree of reasonableness. So how do we overcome this? Generally, we'll have provisions where we try to align the interests and make sure they're together. And in particular, a strong common aspiration statement, common aspiration documents, which set out the vision and the standard of the schemes from the start, so everyone is clear. Also, the agreements will refer to Hughes Master Plan or Pattern Book, as you're referring to, or even if you've got the resource and the time, you can extend out to detailed building manuals and the design code and the flow chart at exchange stage. So all these being detailed and accessible and making it clear to all parties what has to be delivered. Other alignment pr um, provisions you can have, uh, making sure there's a role for the architect in the development agreement, the landowner's architect. You can cross refer to other schemes. And as I mentioned, if the landowner is prepared to go this far, there could be dispute resolution provisions to give the flexibility if possible to the developer. Also cross referring to what the planning regime is permitting. That may be another tool to allow um, a degree of compromise between the two parties. Turning to the construction stage, the landowner's concern here is really two key rights to make sure it can monitor the, the construction and particularly as I say getting down to those working drawings and also a key feature is whether the landowner has the power and the right to certify completion of the works in accordance with the approved scheme. Now this can be the hardest piece of all to negotiate and to settle, but it is a fundamental, along with the discretionary approval of the scheme itself. And you can have different methods of enforcement, each with their own efficacy. A development agreement with no land transfer to the developer, generally known as a building license, gives very effective control in terms of what's built during the construction period. A halfway compromise would be a development agreement with a land transfer, but still with landowner certifying completion. And there are other models like the lease or consortium agreement. The two principal construction obligations that the documents will provide is obviously the, the principal one to deliver the works, including to a program. And program can be quite relevant for the landowner in terms of the, as I put there, keeping the permission alive, if there are future phases or sites coming online, if the planning agreement deadlines, or if the owner is looking to get part of the consideration out of investment property being delivered by the developer or overage receipts. But long stop dates are hard to negotiate as are the remedies that go with them. A termination right, but not delivering by a long stop date is quite a, a, a tough call for a developer but timing of program is, is key. The second key point that we're seeing additionally now in terms of construction obligations is provisions for defects remedies. The industry defect schemes are being reviewed by the government as to whether they are actually delivering. And um, increasingly, it's important for the, the landowner and the scheme as a whole to make sure that defects are dealt with. Turning to the key estate management period, the legal documents here really cover two objectives. First of all, the protection and promotion of the estate design scheme as built. And secondly, the management of the estate to ensure that as built, it is managed and particularly services and works are provided to the standard that the estate design scheme and, the, and its vision anticipates. And as to Hugh alluded to, the practical elements whereby we achieve this in the documentation, in the legal structure, is having a robust design and community code which sets out the standards and also in the legal title we have the estate regulations which again 
have a principal object of complying with the design and state community design and community code but also other regulations to ensure that the community um, behavior and standards are observed by all and additionally a planning agreements increasingly have community stakeholder covenants in as well well there are various legal structures where whereby those um, protective elements may be uh, imposed and I won't cover them all now, but there are a range of them, restrictive covenants, building schemes, doing it by lease, by rent charges or common hold. And the agreements will provide for a combination of those to impose and allow enforcement remedies. But the practical considerations within those legal structures that we come across as being really important and need to be ring fenced in the documents is the control of the issue and variation of the code and the estate regulations, which is best and most robustly done by the original landowner or a responsible trust body. Similarly, the right to grant consents to matters under the code and the state regulations by in effect the same entities. And thirdly, we've been seeing a lot in recent uh, legal structures, keeping a role for the landowner and the responsible entity to have an input into the sale process and the sale packs for dwellings to make sure that the message of the community of the design is passed down and how it is to bind all. The practical issues that we're seeing coming up most often to be um, uh, to be regulated and come up from time to time are really the issue about who has the rights to nominate the occupiers of affordable housing to make sure that um, there, are, uh, there is an aligned community between the private and the affordable dwellings. Unauthorized works on, as indeed on most of your, most of your estates uh, under the, are always a challenge. And uh, that is what the code is there to police robustly. Nuisance uses, again, have to be watched in these projects, whether there's some business use that is too intrusive or too uh, intensive so as to upset the community. And a, a permanent problem that um, has to be judged uh, or dealt with is the parking arrangements and whether that uh, the whole app legacy um, amenity is overwhelmed by uh, parking in inappropriate places. But in this management side, this management structure, the, the, uh, the management company is generally a key element of the, the documentation to enable the services and works to be delivered. And we really do endorse the landowner to have a role as a member um, of the management company so that its role as steward is visible and can be can be uh, demonstrated and is a is a very vibrant and leading part of a management company and that can also ensure that the management company's delivery of services and works that there's a commitment to do it to the code's standards in terms of the public realm current um, debate is uh, as between landowner retaining the public realm so again to ensure the protection of the of the scheme or whether to transfer to a lease or a management company with a sufficient degree of control for the estate owner, for the landowner. There are various options and structures for doing this, but again, we, we, we tend to see that the su success of these legacy projects really depends on the, the robust role and continuing role for the landowner. Public adoption or private management is another key issue at the moment. Increasingly, we're seeing private management on these schemes because you'll get better management and it's more control for those with a vested interest. And increasingly local authorities less keen to adopt these types of projects. And also in the management world and the provision of works and services, a key element is making sure that the developer is kept involved to deal with snagging and defects. These tend to be matters that come directly home to the landowner, the promoter, even though it's a developer issue. So finally, I turn to one of the really key aspects of the legal provisions and for the management period is what we estate deeds. And now these we put in place between the landowner, the management company and the dwelling owner. So you've got a direct, discrete, clear, visible document which covers the provision of services and works. It sets out clearly what's going to be done. And as I said before, importantly, to the standard that's envisaged by the code. It covers the payment of the estate charge and the reserve fund contribution to build up funds to ensure the enhancement, to ensure the protection and if, if need be the enhancement of the, 
development. It has the obligations to comply with the code, the design and community code and the estate regula regulations. And we try on these legacy projects, we take a pride in that these are fully compliant with council of mortgage lenders requirements and industry codes. And as we speak, as one of the other areas that government is reviewing in, in relation to the house building world is just how the, on some of these freehold estate schemes, the, uh, the failing of the estate deeds on account of services being delivered to, impro to improper standards. And in some respects in, re in relation to um, uh, services that actually aren't even being delivered in the first place. So a few indicators there of the, um, the issues that come up, how they're covered in agreement, and uh, but really maintain, making sure that there are robust provisions for the original uh, delivery without, as he referred, uh, the dilution. So I'll now hand you over, if I may, to my colleague, Anthony McNamee, who will uh, cover some planning aspects. Thank you very much. Thanks, Charlie. Um, I'll briefly touch on how the, the public law process of planning and the planning application process interact with the private law provisions that Charlie just mentioned, and obviously the, the vision that Hugh set out. Broadly speaking, I want to talk in terms of a 150 to 100 unit scheme and explain how it goes through the current planning system and some exciting options going forward. I'm just having a bit of a technical problem with the slides, if you bear with me one moment. Okay, so then um, the first slide is basically, oh, sorry. First slide is basically setting up the overall process from getting your site allocated in the local plan to getting planning permission. And broadly speaking, that can take between one and five to seven years going from your concept and your vision where Hugh comes in to your property documents where Charlie comes in and having say 150 units on a site. And obviously that's the Fairwind and a popular scheme. The next slide, briefly, again, touching on allocation. One of your first steps would be to try and have your, your land allocated in the local plan. And until I became a planning lawyer, I had no idea about the allocation process or the call for sites, I'm ashamed to admit. But um, obviously where we are where we are now and I'm more aware. What allocation is, is essentially you will suggest that your fielder couple of fields you want should be allocated in the local plan for housing and almost in exchange for that allocation you'll commit that your site will deliver certain public goods be it open space play areas or some local healthcare provision what allocation does is assist you in ultimately getting planning permission by setting in place the principle that your land can be developed now allocation isn't always necessary, but it's obviously very helpful going forward. After allocation, you still need to produce a planning application. And on the next slide, I briefly set out the different phases you'll go through. So you've got your, your vision in place and you'll carry out pre-application consultation on that vision. The outcome of that consultation will feed into your scheme, which will hopefully be impacted on in a positive way and get public approval on site. If necessary, you'll carry out an environmental impact assessment of the impacts of your proposals. You'll then go through the planning application process. And while that is meant to take roughly 13 weeks for larger schemes, it can obviously take longer depending on the scheme in question. And for a 150 unit scheme, I wouldn't be surprised to be in planning for a year. But again, much depends on the amount of work put into the application and questions left unanswered. Finally, you'll get to the point of determination where the local planning committee will decide whether or not to support your proposal and give it planning permission. Assuming it does give you planning permission, and my next slide 
sets out briefly that you'll have your decision. It will authorise your vision to be brought into reality. It will obviously be subject to conditions designed to ensure that the vision you've put forward is actually what is constructed. There are obviously pre-commencement conditions you'll need to deal with, construction conditions to be dealt with, and operational and ongoing conditions to be dealt with. The, the key point here being that it can take roughly 1.5 years before you'll be able to put a spade in the ground. But that, that time is well spent ironing out details that are still to be finalised. If, however, you do decide that your scheme needs to change slightly, it's possible to make non-material amendments to the scheme and for bigger changes, Section 73 variations, so long as the description of what's been developed doesn't change. Now, alongside the planning permission, there are various infrastructure agreements that you'll need to put in place. And these are all pretty much in standard format and shouldn't be too controversial. Obviously, you'll need planning agreements with the local planning authority to mitigate the impacts of your development, to provide public open space management, to provide uh, affordable housing contributions and so on. You'll need agreements with the water and sewerage companies if it's the intention that infrastructure for sewers is adopted. And you'll also need highways agreements if the intention is that roads servicing your scheme are to be adopted in invariably they will be. Now, that's how you bring forward a scheme at the moment. And in the publication that I referred to a few slides back, we set out some examples of exemplary schemes doing great things in the current regime. With planning for the future, the title of the government's planning white paper, which is currently having consultation responses considered, the government proposes some really meaty and revolutionary changes to the planning system, which if brought forward will I think make it much easier for smaller landowners to bring forward high quality residential schemes. I'm not going to go through every proposal, but I just want to pick on a few, which I think will have a really beneficial impact. The first one is designating, oh, jumped ahead, but that's okay. The first one is designating all of England into one of three areas. Areas for growth in which substantial development will be allowed. Renewal areas where gentle densification will be encouraged and protected areas such as the Green Belt where there aren't any proposals to make changes. Now, in the first of these growth areas, I find the most exciting proposal is that you'll have automatic approvals for pre-established development types. So if we go to the next slide, um, I've drawn on a historic example, but in modern times, this is the kind of stuff that Q in part is doing demonstrating popular local types of housing. And assuming these reforms come forward, I would hope to see modern books like this, making it much easier for small landowners to say, actually, I'm going to build 50 of those because they're already popular and there shouldn't be too much resistance. Again, uh, next slide. The government is also proposing to make the decision making process faster and rely great, uh, to a much greater extent on technology. And I think that's a reform that's long overdue. Having waded through local plans for years now, it's pretty clear that you don't need all of that text. And I, I almost envisage a kind of a Google Earth for planning coming forward, where you zoom in on a site and you can see by clicking some buttons, what can be done on that site. Moving on to the next slide, and as Hermione mentioned, beauty is becoming a, a bigger thing in planning. The government's currently consulting on changes to the NPPF to give beauty greater weight. And in the planning white paper, the proposal involves setting up locally popular design codes and documents. And I, I think that's to be welcomed. I, I can see controversy in it as well, though. I think there are some in the architectural world who don't like the public's view of what's popular, but Ultimately, it's planning is a public process and I think we need to deliver what the public wants. Now, we also need to make sure that we, when thinking about beauty, we're not just talking about aesthetics. We're not talking about some cherubs and some fountains and so on. It's beauty in its widest sense in terms of a place that works and that renews itself and that can be maintained over time. Now, the, the final reform slide I want to talk about quickly is on environmental impact assessment. The government has plans to make this process quicker, simpler and easier. And I think that's long overdue and to be welcomed. 
again, having waded through environmental impact assessments that take up volumes and volumes of folders, I, I do question why the same information needs to be repeated for every application when we can't just have shared baselines, for example. Now, in terms of what happens next, and my final slide, we just need to watch this space. Planning reform is never without controversy, and I, I think the the most recent proposals in the white paper have been more controversial than many of the other government's positions on the European Union, for example. So hopefully this summer, when we've seen the feedback from the white paper, we can see some concrete proposals from Westminster. And on that note, I'll pass you back to Hermione in the questionnaire. That's great. Thank you. Three really interesting presentations which I have really enjoyed and I hope you have too. Um, just before we move on to the Q&A session, I'm hoping that a poll is going to pop up in front of you all. So what, if anything, has held you back from bringing forward surplus land for housing? And you can select as many answers as are applicable. So please do fill in this poll for us. Um, and I will leave it up there whilst I ask our first question. So if I could ask our three panellists to come back online. Thank you very much. And I think I will start with a question for Anthony. Anthony, the planning system, as you've outlined it, seems unnecessarily complex and time consuming. Is it broken? That's a difficult one. Um, I don't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say broken as such. I. I, I was comparing. You know, it's a it's a pithy example. But I was comparing the planning system to a cooker. Someone else the other day, and essentially, the planning system's job isn't to make. You know, I suppose it depends what the planning system's for. The planning system, to my mind, is just so. It's a box that you put things into and get the development out of. Now, if you're going to put in poor quality developments, then obviously it's going to not produce a great outcome, but also it will take time trying to fix a poor quality scheme. High quality schemes inevitably will suffer less resistance and get through that system faster and retaining the vision that's been set out in them. So I, I actually don't think the system's broken. I think it's it's a system that when the right ingredients are put into it, it produces good things. It's just that planning is highly controversial and we're dealing with, for example, schemes and developments which will replace open space with housing that should be there for 100 or 200 years. So it should be a thorough process to vet proposals. Yeah, no, that's interesting. And I'll, I'll stick with you, Anthony, just for one more question that's just come in. How will the white paper affect the green belt? Will villages in green belts be left to wither and die as they currently are with current constraints? Well, it, you know, it's the, the elephant in the room that wasn't included in the white paper to any extent. The white paper basically skirted over the issue of the green belt, I think. And again, much is to come out when this goes before Parliament in the form of draft legislation. I just can't imagine the green belt not being up for some form of uh, either chipping away or change to allow, as you say, settlements to avoid dying. I don't. The green belt. I, I don't think it was ever the intention of the green belt to actually stymie people living their lives. Mm, yeah. Okay. And Hugh. Oh, in fact, before I ask the next question, hopefully you will all be able to see the results from the poll that you've all answered. Um, so if our panellists want to have a quick look at that, I don't know if you will have any comments in response. I think we can see the greatest proportion has been the perceptions of cost and complexity for bringing, bringing land forward. Yeah. And I, I, you know, that perception point is actually really important because as I, as I mentioned, before I became a planning lawyer, for example, I didn't know about the call for sites process in any detail. And even now, I think a lot of the planning process is a bit, uh, it's quite unclear to people. You know, 
no one, the, the, the data is out there, but it's spread around so many different sources that you get an army of professionals involved. And I, I, I would hope it doesn't need to be as complicated as it can seem. Mm. And so moving on to another question, we have a question for the panel from Sebastian Anstruther. Private build to rent and affordable private rent to deliver affordable housing requirement. Does the panel have any experience of landowners building, retaining developments under these policies in the national planning policy framework? So, um, sorry, can you, can you, yeah. I was going to say, we, so um, obviously I can't say, I can't, obviously I can't name, we can't name clients, but yes, um, short answer, yes. And and actually the, the sort of projects we've been involved in, the quality of build material and the quality of design, actually the, the clients do make their money back, even though they're affordable housing that's being produced and provided. And it, it, you know, it really strikes me that affordable housing and how built to rent doesn't have to be cheap. People, one, deserve good homes, but two, and other, other affordable providers notice this, they will pay a premium for higher quality units and accommodation. Mm. Yes. Okay. I've had a similar experience to um, Hermione. And I think um, uh, affordable houses a lot of these sort of legacy schemes, if you like, a lot of de normal developers would try and design out affordable housing. They see it as a blight on their um, what they're trying to do. Whereas, of course, a landowner of a long-term interest, trying to work with their local community, you know, there is a, an ongoing local need there. And if you can meet that need, uh, that actually makes your scheme more popular and is you know, the right thing for big landowners to do. And, and of course, these houses are affordable for a period of time after which there's a review. And so if you build and hold the affordable housing, there may come a moment, you know, a hundred years time or whatever, when it's not needed anymore, in which case it can become open market housing. So I think it's not so something that needs to be avoided. If it's part of an overall comprehensive long-term vision, you know, it can be a very constructive thing and can never, not just you know, a financial dividend on the, on the open market houses, but also a social dividend in terms of meeting a very profound local need. Yes, I, I, I endorse all of that. And um, 20 years ago, people were talking about 20% affordable. Some projects now it's up to 40%, which is a major stakeholding in, in the project. And for the reasons Anthony and you said, it, it, has, it plays its part. It's pepper potted in with the private. It's got a lot to deliver. Um, and we know the evidence from registered providers is that they, they jump for these legacy schemes because they have very few voids very few uh, arrears and they know the, um, the management charges are, uh, are reasonable um, because of the quality of the build and the outcome. But yes, we are seeing people um, take it on as, uh, as their own investment. Um, the, the, one of the issues is possibly the direct management, but if it's a landowner that is already managing um, residential property or there's the, the pot potential to, to contract out, um, but also it helps on the nomination rights point of view. If you can, if it helps you, if you can get to the position where additionally you are, um, have got a, an input into who's actually going to be occupying, that can help your community as well. Um, there's an additional point that uh, estates with built to rent and affordable units actually draw in cash faster than those schemes which don't have high affordable housing numbers. I'm not quite sure the reason why, but it's, I can provide the research afterwards. Mm, no, thank you. Really interesting. Um, we've got lots of good questions coming in, so I'll try and get through as many as I can within our time frame. Um, so we've had a question saying, um, with all respect to your excellent panellists, hiring your expertise is evidently going to be expensive. Could you all agree on a minimum size scheme which would justify such costs? Well, I mean, take, take the infrastructure agreements that I mentioned. They, they can be done for fixed fees. And it's, you know, most lawyers, I would imagine, would charge roughly the same. And I, I just don't think you could get away with not having um, sewage agreements and 106 agreements and, and so on. And again, I think moving forward, looking at the future, if reforms around uh, design guidance, 
in pattern books take hold, that will help reduce costs for the very smallest of schemes. And, and certainly because we've, we're 20, 30 years in from the initial legacy projects, um, we've been able to refine a lot of the, the legal documents to which I, I, I was alluding. And, um, uh, and that's not just the pure law provisions, but it's where law meets the architecture, i.e. the, the flowchart process and the uh, approval sequence, um, the covenants. I mean, the states have always had sets of covenants that they impose on, on selling land off. And so a lot of it has, has been refined. And the, the great estates that have been involved for 20 to 30 years, you know, um, have been sharing. You know, there is a, ve a very big culture in the legacy stewardship world to share the information and to to help um, get a product that can is uh, it, that works for all and actually is is deliverable at cost and uh, another way of answering the same question Hermione it's going to often debated amongst um, estates and, and developers in this world is that you want to find places where there's a, a, you can add value if you like because obviously there is a cost that comes with it I think there's a general feeling that you need to have an area where the sales are in excess of 200 pounds a square foot minimum, ideally a bit more than that to sort of carry the extra cost. Uh, and the cost of construction might be 10% more than the same house built somewhere else with its standard elevation, but with a better layout and, and better public realm um, detail. But the evidence that we are collecting is that the resale values are probably uh, typically at least 10% more on the bigger houses and might be 20% more on some of the you know, smaller houses where there's the sweet spot in the local market and also we're now retracking the resale values too and over time those resale values on these sorts of schemes are significantly outperforming the local market with PLC built um, schemes elsewhere. Yeah okay I think I'll probably have to ask our final question um, which is to to the panel. I'm a landowner in the early stages of a significant and complex scheme Inevitably, with many stakeholders, all of whom have their own viewpoint and expertise, how do I avoid being a small cog in a large machine that is steered by others? Uh, are the others, by stakeholders, are they other, um, other landowners? Is, um, or is it by the other the, stakeholders being the registered provider, the, the developer, the... Yeah. They've said stakeholders, so I imagine absolutely engagement with the local communities, local authority. Yeah. 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 Well, it, 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 as I was saying in my piece, I, it, these projects do generally thrive best where you have got the landowner who is taking the, the robust lead and um, uh, is, it has the initial vision working with the, with the master plan to to say this is it, come on the journey. And for the reasons that Hugh's just said about the end returns, you know, we're hoping we're seeing developers come on board, registered providers are on board, councils are on, on board, um, and certainly the communities are on board, if you get. So. If you go back to my principal slide, Hermione, the, the, the 10 principles I showed you on Men's Leaden, the first one was public consultation and not being in a hurry and taking the confident step of just going to talk to your community, find out what their needs are and how you can work together to satisfy those needs. And if you make your vision popular in that sense, it starts to gain political traction and it'll start to become a sort of snowball that grows um, and, and therefore overcomes the other obstacles and becomes a, a, a coherent view, if you like. You just need to be able to have the, the um, time to, to identify those key principles that you really want to deliver and then to work with the community in partnership with them to make sure that you can do something which satisfies their needs as well as your ambition. Okay, again, it's just, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm seeing the same thing different, in a different way, but it's, it's have the vision. You know, you know, being a small cog isn't a bad thing if all the bigger cogs are moving to your vision. Yeah, great way to great way to sum up. Um, so again, we're running a second poll, which I hope will pop up on our screens in a moment. There we go. This one isn't multiple choice, so please just pick one answer. And the poll is from what you have heard today. Do you think the government's planning reforms might persuade you to bring land forward? That be might be your own land or your client's land. And we would love to hear from you whilst we whilst we keep that on the screen. Um, if we can reshare the presentation. 
Perfect. Um, so yeah, we have come to the end of our time, um, but I just want to take this opportunity to thank our three speakers today um, for three really interesting and informative presentations and a great Q&A session afterwards. Um, so both Farrah and Co and Adams Architecture have produced some really interesting publications and you can see the name of the publications on the screen now, but we will be sending you a web link to all four of those in the coming week. So make sure you keep an eye out for that. Um, I must also thank Farrah and Co for sponsoring this webinar and thank you Petter from Adam Architecture for being our guest panelist today. Um, and before I say thank you to all of you for attending, if we could close the poll and see what results have come up there, which, can we share the results from the poll? I might have lost it, I've got so many screens open. There we go. Um, so again, I don't know if any of our panelists want to say a final couple of words on, on that final poll results. I, was, I think really as I expected I think you know we're, we're on a journey it's a very complicated machine but the encouraging thing is from my perspective that for the first time in a very long time there's a lot of things happening in government which are really exciting and you think might actually come to fruition because there are good people pushing them um, and there seems to be a general mood swing that they, we do need to do something radically different so I think it is a moment of, of uh, to be, be optimistic and, and to do our best to encourage these things to come to fruition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, I agree. Get, getting to where we've got a template that people can adopt uh, quickly and with certainty and with less cost. Uh, well, I think that's probably a really positive place to end. So thank you all very much for attending this webinar this afternoon. We hope that you found it really useful and we hope to see you at another CLA webinar soon.